All right, let's open this up. You ready for us or do you want anything you want to say? Uh, no, just hit me with questions. That's fine. Okay. Let's go. We're going to just have a nice conversation. <laughs> We're not like professional or anything. <laughs> We're amateurs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, no welcome everybody. Mm -hmm. I think we've got about 35 people coming into the room, just joining us now. Very excited. I'll wait another minute and then I'll, I guess I'll start with an introduction. Do you think there's what, four or five people left in the state who don't know who Bob Stefanowski is? <laughs> but I do know that Roberto Cabrera sitting in New York City, he might not know. So Never heard of him. So there's a good there's a good chance that we may have some people on who, who are encountering Bob Stefanowski for the first time. So I guess with that backdrop, I'll say that uh, welcome to Burroughs and Burbs episode 40. Our guest, featured guest is Bob Stefanowski, candidate for governor of Connecticut. Uh, this is typically a real estate show, not a politics show. We don't know anything about politics here. But we do know a thing or two about real estate, and we are very interested in your vision for Connecticut and how it affects the real estate market. Um, Roberto, what are you hoping to get out of the hour? I'm hoping to learn just a little bit more about just the relationship, a little bit of the relationship of New York to Connecticut and, and the migration and how it's viewed and if that's an issue uh, from a standpoint of real estate supply, uh, schools being overcrowded, things like that. Is it a welcome thing? Is it not? Does it make it more difficult for Connecticuts who are just, you know, now all of a sudden, maybe they're getting priced out from just being able to just upgrade a little bit? Is it become more difficult? Uh, I want to know something. I want That's along the lines of what I want to know. Yeah, I think from a New Yorker look, from the outside looking in, you're wondering, is a... Uh, you know, why are all these New Yorkers heading out to Connecticut and is this going to continue? So I guess I'll start with that question, Bob. Um, what's your views just generally on um, what's happening in Connecticut now? I mean, we're going through a massive change and a reprioritization as a result of COVID. And a lot of people are reevaluating Connecticut's relationship with New York. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I guess a couple things. Um, number one is I think it's it's hard to argue when people are coming into your state that that is a bad thing, uh, particularly in Connecticut, where we've got an affordability issue. Connecticut has the second highest taxes in the entire country. We've got the highest energy rates in the continental U.S. And um, you know, obviously, I've got my own views on, on on how to change those things that we can talk about. Um, outside or even with the influx of people from New York last year, Connecticut had the fifth highest migration rate out. There was a study done by um, the van lines. Um, I forget the name of the van line, but Connecticut, there were only four states that had more people move out last year than Connecticut. So I think you've got a bit of a bifurcation, which has always been an issue in Connecticut. We have one of the largest wealth gaps in the nation. You've got a lot of people later in their lives who, who may be on a fixed income. And it's very tempting to look down to Florida or Tennessee where there is no state income tax and, and real estate prices are a lot lower. And one of my, my goals as governor is to try to give them the flexibility to stay because most of the people that I talk about, they don't want to leave for Florida or California, but they're on a fixed income the property taxes, the car tax, the sales tax, the, the, the loss of the, uh, the SALT deduction for state and local income taxes, and they just say, I can't afford to be here. I think what we're seeing on the other end is what you mentioned, which is, and I, I, I think you, you probably have a better idea than I do as to why, but certainly part of it was COVID and getting out of New York City during the heat of it. I do think part of it is, is a permanent change with people maybe not going into New York City every day, maybe going in two days and working home for three days. So I think the challenge for, for the governor is how do you incent those people to stay long-term? 
I think there's going to be a fair number of people that have moved to Connecticut and when they get that property tax bill and that car tax and the state tax bill, they're going to maybe rethink, well, geez, I didn't know it was so expensive to live here. So, so for me, it's how do we make sure that we keep those people happy? Because you, you do want a growing population. Um, so at the end of the day, the people moving in is terrific. The question is, what are we going to provide them such that they want to stay? And this is not just a one-time inflow. So I think it's an extraordinary time, an extraordinary opportunity to lower the state income tax, uh, to lower the sales tax with, with, with 40 year high inflation and a fixed sales tax at 6.35%, the amount of money coming into the government is higher than it used to be. So I think we should be lowering that state income tax rate and take some pressure off, particularly the, the, the middle class who feels it the most. So. There's a lot of things we can do, a very long-winded answer to your question, John, but I view it as a good thing, but it also creates some complications to policy that, that we need to think through. So I want to drill down a little deeper on affordability. I mean, you mentioned uh, taxes and trying to cut taxes to make it more affordable, but Connecticut has some of the highest costs of living in the country. Uh, and you said in your campaign, you want to build a better, more affordable Connecticut. From a realtor's point of view, who's watching um, million dollar houses get bulldozed over in the current economy in favor of six million dollar houses in Greenwich. But the same thing is being is happening in, say, uh, Norwalk or Bridgeport or you know, all throughout the county, where we're getting rid of some of our most affordable housing in favor of uh, building new, more expensive housing. What's that going to do and how does that square with a better, more affordable Connecticut? Well, a, affordable housing is important and it can all be $6 million mansions. And I, I remember a couple of years ago, John, I looked at buying an investment property in Greenwich. If you remember the prices were dirt cheap uh, and I'm kicking myself like a lot of other people that, that I didn't dive in. Um, what I'm very, very sensitive to is I think whether it's affordable housing or zoning, I firmly believe that should be left up to the individual town. Uh, we've got 169 towns in, in Connecticut. It's part of our, our nature, it's part of our character. There are a lot of efforts coming out of, out of Hartford right now, particularly um, out of Mayor Luke Ronan in Hartford and somewhat Governor Lamont to regionalize and to set quotas by region. I'm against that. Um, I do think to your point, we've got to create housing that's affordable so that all people can live there. The other uh, potential but, that I think- But is that a free market kind of thing that the free market should just be doing that? Or is that something that Hartford is supposed to, I don't know, help or mandate or incentivize? Well, there are, there are minimum levels um, and I forget the percentage, but every city or town is supposed to have a minimum level of quote, affordable housing which is under a certain amount. Many towns have not followed that. And that has reduced, resulted in some pressure towards a regionalization. The bigger pressure, which I think would be a disaster for housing prices in places like Greenwich and, and Fairfield and Westport is a forced regionalization of schools. And um, I think that will vary if, if, if they push it through. And I know Governor Lamont is, is behind it, I think. A, I think it's bad policy. I, I think the funding for a kid's education should follow the child rather than the school. If you look at Hartford, they spend $16,000 a year to educate per pupil. 30% of them don't graduate from college. 20% of them or 80% of them don't test at the age appropriate levels in math. I think we should be focused on fixing education, giving parents the choice to where their kid goes to school as opposed to forcing kids out of the city to go into the, the school districts elsewhere. Um, so it's interesting, the real estate market is a very, it, it touches everything. As you guys know, I was happy to get the endorsement of the Connecticut Realtors last time around against Governor Lamont. I think a lot of the Democrat- I, I Why know do you think that was? Why do you think Realtors like you? Or did? Uh, because they I'm like more the last time around. <laughs> We're gonna find out at the end of the hour that they still yeah. love you. Well, I'm more of a free market guy rather than, than regulation. I do think the individual towns do an infinitely better job managing themselves than what Hartford does managing the state. So why would we take good local management 
and supersede that with people who, in my opinion, have failed at a statewide level. I do think people should have choice. I think in general, and I'm sure there's some Democrats on the phone, I think in general, at least Democrats in Connecticut in leadership positions have been wanting to take away choice. Part of it is COVID. Part of it, I think, is, is just their philosophy that government should have more influence over things like where your kid goes to school and what your kid is taught in school and whether your kid should wear a mask to school. And, and these are very emotional issues, but I think they do impact the real estate market because it's going to impact where people move to. So with all due respect to my partner, Roberto Cabrera, Connecticut Connecticut commuters would just rather not go into New York. And I know if you ask Roberto, he's going to say, New York is back, baby. And, you know, the restaurants are open and we are open for business. But you know what? Uh, the Metro North parking lot across the street from my office is empty every day. Now, our I-95 and our Mayor Parkway are full, but the uh, Metro North is not full. And if you ask most Connecticutites, they would rather not commute and they're not commuting. And you alluded to this, they're not commuting every day. And what we're beginning to find is uh, they're, they're, they're considering towns they weren't considering five years ago because they didn't think they were commutable. Now they're considering a whole lot more of Connecticut for living. Do you see this trend continuing and what does that do to changing the nature of Connecticut from a bedroom community to maybe more self-sufficient and more complete in the future? Well, I think it's a permanent shift. And, and again, you guys may know better than I, but I've been spending time all across the state. And it's just, it's not just Fairfield County, it's New Milford. It's it's sounds north and, and west of, of, of Hartford. And and this is not people just extending their commute by 30 minutes. This is people extending their commute by an hour. I believe under the theory that they can go into the office a couple of times a week and sustain that as opposed to five days, uh, which is tough. I think the other thing we can do to, and to, to, to help Connecticut would be if you look at Metro North, the travel time from New Haven to, 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 New, to New York is longer than it used to be. It's, it's the only service that has deteriorated. And, and my view is, is because it's a monopoly where you've got the price going up and the service level coming down. I do think, um, although I don't agree with the massive stimulus package uh, the Biden administration is putting in, the billions of dollars that we're getting from the federal government should be invested in rail. That would help cities like Bridgeport that are a bit out of the commuting zone right now. So Even I though think the it's rail is empty right now, there's nobody that? on. That's just temporary. Uh, I think it's going to be down. I do think it, it it'll jump back somewhat, but I don't think we're ever going to. I can remember John getting on that Metro North and standing room only in the bar cart. <laughs> I don't personally. I don't think we're going to get back to that. I think people have gotten used to the telecommute. But we do have to. It, we. But you are saying that. Transportation is is still going to be critical moving forward. We can't just turn our backs on Metro North. It's an important piece of the puzzle. I think it's an opportunity. You look at Bridgeport, John, if, if someone were to tell you, here's a city with a deep water port that's uh, you know 40 miles from New York. It's next to one of the best universities in the world. It's a midway point between New York and Boston, and we can't find a way to make that city work. A lot of it is corruption in my opinion, um, but that should be something that we can take advantage of. And, and part of my plan for Connecticut is to revitalize these cities. That's why young people are leaving. I mean, my daughter, we live in Madison. She blows right by Stanford on her way to New York and she blows right by Hartford on her way to Boston. And I think if we can create cities, because the other thing that, that you all know better than I do is we're seeing a migration back from the suburbs into the cities. And, and in order to take advantage of that, we've got to have more vibrant cities. Roberto, you got anything? I mean, I can keep going. Well, I'm just, I'm just thinking about the aspect that, you know, at some point the, for example, in New York, yes, there's people that are going to be coming in two, three times a week, as opposed to five days a week, but all of the gaps that have been left by people leaving are going to get filled by other people in the country who want to be here. 
And after a certain period of time, after several years, the employers are going to say, you know, why are we employing so-and-so and so-and-so from Connecticut and New Jersey and this and that when everybody's right here and we can meet every day as a group. And it's a little bit different from Zoom. You know, you have the opportunity to create a culture and it's very difficult to create culture when you're on a Zoom. It's very, very difficult. And I just think that it's going to be, I just think that things are going to eventually go back to normal. Not that there's, not that five days a week. But I think the people that are going too far out into some of these other, other neighborhoods and some of these other townships, that they're going to feel a little marginalized after a certain period of time. That's just what I feel. You're That's assuming that everybody point. wants to raise their kids in New York City. I'm everybody not saying that. Everybody in New York City wants to raise their kids there. And Bob just said, and I would echo, that we invest in our schools. If we give you good schools and good transportation to get here, New Yorkers will come, right, Bob? But there are people who want to come to New York also. Not to say that you can have, there's tons of people who want to be in Connecticut and don't have anything against Connecticut. It's wonderful. But there are tons of people who are not here in other parts of the country who do want to come here and raise their kids. John, you and, and, and Bob echoed, okay, um, let us remember that pre-COVID, the real estate market in Connecticut was in the sewer. For nine years, values, I mean, Bob is, Bob is, 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 is pulling his hair out that he didn't buy that investment property in Greenwich. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, yes, Fairfield County, okay, um, with its access to, to New York. But let's, but let's not forget something, okay? I, I happen to agree um, with Bob that, that there are people who absolutely have the taste now of not having to commute, and they love it. And when they don't, don't have a paycheck because their employer tells them that they're going to get into the office or they're not going to have a job. And we know that that is happening. And we know that, that the more that the numbers in New York go down, the more it is going to happen. We know that the investment banking firm, we know that the law firms had put out the word that they wanted them back in July. And if Omicron had not shown up, they would be back. So your extended Connecticut um, I, Roberto makes a, a very good point. That's the Fairfield County. Okay, so the divide is that some of us feel that there's a decoupling and less of a dependence on New York. And you and Roberto are making the case that it's only temporary and that, that we will have a, we will continue to have a dependency on New York City. What do follow you think, the Bob? money. Follow the money. The employers will dictate, okay. not the employees. Bob, is our strategy to recruit new business into Connecticut in order to sort of defend against that uh, against what they're saying? Well, I think it's both. I think it's lowering the the corporate tax relative to our neighbors in uh, in Massachusetts and New York to give them incentive to come here, but it's also lowering our state income tax rate. I'm old enough to remember when Connecticut had no state income tax and people love to live in, in Fairfield County and, and commute into Newark, particularly now that you don't get the salt deduction on your federal return for state taxes. So I'm a free market guy. I'm a big believer that tax policy drives behavior. And the best way we can keep this real estate market going, in my opinion, is to start to lower both the individual and the corporate tax rates relative to our neighbors. Now, to your point, Roberto, some people won't care because they'll move from Kansas to New York City. But I view being the governor of Connecticut as partly a marketing job. You've got to convince people to come here. And when you've got the second highest tax in the, in, in the country, and you've got the highest energy costs in the continental US, and you've got $60,000 of debt per person, 100 billion of debt, 60,000 per person, and you've got an unfunded pension liability. I don't want to make this a stump speech, but you know, Warren Buffett came out and said years ago, any state that has an unfunded pe pension liability higher than 30 to 40%, he would never invest in. So you've got to make the state attractive for people to want to be here. How are we going to make it attractive for business to be here? Well, I think there's a lot of waste, uh, John. You know, Governor Lamont raised the budget by $5 billion since he's been in office. We brag about having a $2 billion budget surplus, which is terrific, but we got 6 billion of COVID money. We increased our debt capacity by 20 billion over the last several years. 
and we've got a $2 billion uh, surplus. Where did the other 22 billion go or whatever the math is? So one of the things we're gonna do is audit every state agency because I'm convinced there's waste, fraud and abuse. We've seen it already in towns like West Haven. And if we can lower that cost base and get that down and give some of the benefit back to taxpayers and fund education properly, then I, I think it'll help everybody. But as you know, one of the biggest selling points we have in Connecticut is the quality of our schools. We've got to maintain that quality. We so you mentioned the bed, you mentioned the budget surplus, and I believe that the current plan is to spend that budget surplus on property tax, lowering the property tax. Um, is that a good idea? And how? What do you think is uh, is that the priority, or do we do you have a different priority on how you'd spend any any surplus? You know, it's interesting when I when I ran the first time, I was focused on income tax, and and as I've spent time over the last three years, it's really that property tax and the car tax because you've got to cut a check for it. It's kind of a psychological thing. The income tax, you see it, but most people have a withholding. And, and, and the other issue is the property tax and the car tax hits the middle class hard. And I think this time it'll be income tax, but also I agree with the governor, um, property tax and auto tax. We'll see if it gets through the legislature because when I debated the governor three years ago, he said he was gonna deliver a 300 million property tax cut that hasn't gotten done yet. We'll see if it gets through the legislature, but we need to bring the tax burden down you can't be a successful state when you've got the second highest taxes. We work between January 1st to May 24th just to pay our state and federal taxes. The first five months of the year, we're working to pay the government. After that, the money starts to be ours. And in my opinion, that's out of whack. I have 153,000 miles on my car because like everybody else in Connecticut, you can't buy a new car because there aren't any to buy. So when we're done limping along with these cars and we buy, we start buying new cars again, maybe, maybe, maybe those taxes will become more apparent. But right now, I, I you know, I don't pay much tax on my little beater. So um, Scott Hobbs is in the little cell underneath you. He's a small businessman. He's got a hundred people on the payroll, and he's got I don't know two, three hundred subcontractors. And when we went into COVID, uh, he, he talked about the regulation and all the rules he has to. So what's your answer for guys like Scott Hobbs? And Scott, do you want to articulate the question maybe a little bit more elegantly and succinctly um, on your challenges as a business owner within the business climate of Connecticut? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, it, moving beyond taxes, because you already talked about that, and that ends up being, again, a huge burden. But then there's all the regulatory stuff. And when you go ahead and you, you know, we just instant, we recently instituted the uh, family leave, paid family leave program. And there's a lot of things that just kind of tell employers that if you move to Connecticut, you're going to become the, the your, your employees are going to become your entire responsibility from cradle to grave. And I mean, are there some other things besides for this new print plan? And do you have any ways to help to, ease kind of that, to make it easier for people to be entrepreneurial in Connecticut? Well, I think you're spot on on regulation. It's very, very hard to, to, to run a small business in Connecticut. We will try to streamline that for sure. Um, I was not a big fan of the Paid Family Medical Leave Act. I, the concept is terrific. Uh, first of all, I think it's massively underfunded relative to the amount of claims that we'll have. I don't know if you realize it, but you don't even need to be the relative of a person. It could be your best friend's mother who's having a tough time and you take six months off uh, to deal with that. So there doesn't even need to be a, a family connection to qualify for it. It took them a year to set it up. They've got a massive bureaucracy set up and it just kicked off recently. I think the premiums that both the employer and the employees have to pay into that are gonna go up substantially. So that's a problem. There's also, you know, with this surplus, I've argued that we should be paying down some of the debt that was taken out by small business to pay for unemployment. That bill is lurking out there. If we've got a $2 billion surplus, there's nobody better that we can help than promoting small business in our state. And then the other thing that's surprising to me is whether it's a restaurant or a high tech machine shop, people are having trouble finding workers. 
So we've got a situation where our unemployment rate in Connecticut is 2% higher than the nation. We still haven't recovered the jobs from the Great Recession. We're the only state in the entire nation that hasn't recovered the jobs from the Great Recession, yet you talk to employers about what their biggest issue is and is that we can't find people. So something is breaking down in the system. I think we need to invest more in our trade schools. Uh, yeah, getting a, get a four-year college degree is terrific for some people, but coming out with $250,000 of debt or more when you could have gone directly to a trade school, the, the employment rate, every, every kid coming out of a trade school has two, three, four job offers. So we need to be shifting some of that over. And um, I'm a big fan of small business. So what keeps our economy going in Connecticut I, think, I do think in fairness to Governor Lamont, he's done some things to help small business, but I do think there's a lot more we could be doing. Definitely. So, go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. No, I definitely appreciate that. And it, it's, it's anything that can go ahead and encourage people that if you come here, you can, you can worry about running your business and not having to worry about being hit by the uh, state um, in order to make it more difficult. I mean, as part of Rotary, we also hear from a bunch of nonprofits, and inevitably, I ask one of the questions I ask is, "What you know? What could somebody do to make your life easier?" And it's get rid of the red tape from Hartford. And I'm involved in affordable housing, and I have the same thing. It's just the, the red tape is crushing. Scott, how often do you get a call from somebody in Florida or, or North Carolina with a deal to go down there with land half the price and a taxi-free three-year period? I mean, most businesses are getting those calls regularly. We, we actually, I mean, because of our business, we, we don't have that, but like I'm sitting in a, it, virtually I'm sitting inside like one of our clients, uh, Oceanside uh, porches, and a tremendous number of our clients have houses down in Florida and are now Florida residents. And what that does to the philanthropy, what that does to the tax base and everything else is just terrible. So, you know, again, forcing our, our most wealthy clients out because we want to just try to extract more money from them does not seem to be a good uh, process or policy in my well, mind. You know, again, I'm a big believer in tax policy. You've got no income tax in Florida versus 6.99% here, and you have no death tax in Florida, and we have the estate tax. And a lot of the people, particularly hedge funds, they've built their business up and and they're forced to leave. They look at the numbers and they're forced to leave. And And, and, and the issue that I have is that brings your biggest taxpayers that you're relying on and moves them out of the state. And, and it takes thousands of, of us normal people to make up for the amount that you lose by one you know, person like that moving out. I talked to a guy yesterday who's, ta who's thinking about moving to Florida. And let me just put a, 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 some numbers to his decision-making. So he's thinking about selling a $5 million house in Connecticut. And he said, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at the East coast of Florida. And he said, I'm looking from Palm Beach all the way down Boca Raton, Fort Lauderdale, you know, anything I can afford. And he said, but if I replace my $5 million house with a $5 million house down there, I'm, I'm paying 2% property tax per year, $100,000. But he said, I have not been able to find anything in the current market, overheated market. So even though he might get five in Connecticut, he said, it looks like I might have to spend 10 to get the equivalent on the East Coast of Florida. He says, I'm hoping to spend eight, but that means $200,000. So it's not a no brainer for these guys. I don't think it's inevitable that we lose these guys when they're staring at a $200,000 a year property tax bill, you know, for, a fan, for an equivalent fancy house in Florida, I think we have a chance to make this attractive and keep them here. And it is a lot about taxes. I, I agree with you, John. I, I think we've missed the curve in Florida. Now, what you're seeing now is North Carolina, Tennessee. And I don't think that's kind of as, as you know, as sexy. sexy or whatever the right word is, as Florida. But particularly in the middle to upper middle class, South Carolina, North Carolina, it started to expand. Florida, particularly that southern part of Florida, I agree with you, is very, very pricey. So, are you? So, is it just is it just the affluent who are leaving for these purposes, or is this the middle class also that's that's literally making that calculation and leaving? The biggest category I see is is someone. I, I turned the big six zero this year. 
somebody who has worked in Connecticut, they've lived their whole life here. They're now on a fixed income. They know it's fixed forever. Property taxes are going up five, 10%. They lose the salt deduction. Gas prices are as high as they are. They slap another tax on gas and it's just starting to add up where people, they really, really do not want to leave, but they look at the numbers and, and, and they simply can't afford to stay. The other category you see is where people, their, their kids have moved down south because either A, there's no career here or there's not a vibrant city. So they move down there to be closer to their grandkids. And, and both of those things should be reversible to your point, John, with good policy. You can't do it overnight. But I, I, this will sound political, but I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, I'm giving it one more election. And, and if we don't see somebody like you in office, we're out of here. So, the, so people are trying to hang on, uh, but it hasn't gotten much better. And, and we're losing people because of that. Is part of it that the people don't have anywhere to go? For example, these people, their, their kids are gone and they want to downsize, but they really they can't sell their house because they can't find anything anywhere else to go. So they have to look elsewhere. So, which leads me to, we had a, we had a show and we had the, a bunch of condo developers from Connecticut who were willing to deploy a tremendous amount of money to build and build more and more condominiums. However, there was so much resistance from all the little townships and these people, like one of them had spent $2 million and spent three or four years just getting all of the approvals before he could start his project, which was a tremendous risk. So they are also becoming a little hesitant. Is on a macro level, like at your level, is there any way to incentivize those townships to look, make it a little easier, get this through such that we can create housing to also, if you're you know, making smaller places, you, can, you have a home for the younger generation to come and grow. It's a terrific question. And, and I do think there's some things to do, you can do as governor. But I also think it, it, it's, it shows the importance of these local elections. When, when you think about it, you look at turnout, the presidential election gets the highest, the governor the second, and the local elections, if we get 30 to 40% of the people to come out, that's a good, but, but those are the people that have the most direct impact on how your town is run. So I think it's trying to get the right people into, into the towns that are kind of pro-business. I live in Madison. They've done a terrific job. We're AAA rated, uh, but to your point, it's not easy to move into Madison because because the price point is so far up. Um, so I think that's more a function of local government rather than state government. The approach I will take is that you know the local politicians and the local leaders should have the authority. I'll help where I can, but we've got enough issues at the statewide level. Just as an aside, the state owns hundreds, if not thousands of abandoned properties right now that are just sitting there idle. Some of them are commercial, some of them are residential, but we should be looking at, at, at selling off those to developers and getting some revenue out of them rather than just sitting on the balance sheet without any, any revenue whatsoever. Did you hear John, that, Scott? I, can I jump in for a second? Yes. But Bob, um, I'm a little older than you. So um, I've been listening to, um, and I'm in New York, okay? You just flew I've been in listening from to People on Long Island talk about being on fixed incomes and can't, can't afford it. I've, I've, I've heard them talk about affordable housing. I've heard them talk about high cost of living. And I've been hearing that for probably 60 years. And I'm hearing it today. So, so where's the, what? So where's the beef? Where's the plan? I mean, and I'm not talking about just you. I'm talking about, you know, Roberto just referenced about the condo developers. Um, you want to leave it to the local municip municipalities, but they're doing, but they're not doing it. They're making it more difficult with more regulation. You're anti-regulation. They're doing. They're making it more difficult. So, so how do you get it done? I, and I'm, I'm really not trying to pass the buck, but I think a lot of it comes to the local elections and getting the right people in office. We'll look at things statewide that we can do to, to increase the level of, of building and, and make it easier for people. But my, I, I hate to come in and say, you've got a local town with a local elected board or, or, or first selectman, and I'm gonna overrule what they say. 
it's hard. Why don't we have a, Why haven't we solved the affordable housing problem? How come we haven't haven't solved over sixty years the high costs? How come we haven't we haven't solved the problem that people are on fixed incomes and that's what happens when people get older they get on fixed incomes? Why and what makes us think that we can solve it today? Again, I go back to what I said earlier. I think you have to start on the spending side. Connecticut, as you know, didn't have a state income tax. We were the highest growth state in the entire nation. We put a state income tax at 3%. A lot of that money went over to support pretty lucrative benefit and pension plans for state employees. They used the income tax as a slush fund. It was, and this, these are Democrat and Republican governors. They didn't fund the pension plan. They sucked it out for other reasons in the general fund and other crazy spending. And now we've ended up in a, in a situation where we've got a high income tax and an underfunded pension plan. And to me, you know, the only way to get this back is to start looking at that budget. We spent $25 billion a year in the state of Connecticut. I And met many of you are businessmen and businesswomen. I've never seen a business that didn't have at least 10% fat in it, never. And I got to believe you in a state run organization, it's probably 20%. So one of the things I'm advocating is zero-based budgeting, where we come in, I don't care that the budget is 25 billion. When I start my first day, the budget's zero. And you come to me and you you rational, I, I was the CFO of UBS, we did it, we took out 10 billion a cost because it's amazing what you find that is supposedly essential that when you look at it from that perspective, do we really absolutely have to have a company car for every executive? Do we have to have a black SUV, not only for the governor, but for the lieutenant governor and the treasurer and the and the attorney general? Uh, probably not. <laughs> so, and, and, and none of these things are massive, but they start to add up to real money. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to rein in taxes is you have to start with the spending side. And that's not cutting education. That's not cutting essential social services. It's just being more efficient with the money that we have. I mean, it's kind of the, the pat uh, political phrase, but um, we don't have a revenue problem in Connecticut. We've got a spending problem. And in my humble opinion, both Democrats and Republicans have been afraid to touch that because it starts to go after public interest groups that they count on for their base. And you need to put the politics aside and you need to do the right thing for Connecticut. And if that means I'm a four-year governor, so be it but I'm gonna run Connecticut like a business, not like a political operation. Wow. Thanks, Michael. You got it. You, you, I think you got him riled up. <laughs> it's just, it's frustrating to see John because we've got so many resources in Connecticut. We got terrific people. We got terrific small businesses. We got great universities. We got a diversity of industries. If there's any state in the nation that should, why is Florida kicking our butt right now? What do they have that we don't, they got better weather, I guess. But what, you know, it's it's economic policy, it's leadership, it's transparency, and and, and it's running things like a, like, like a business. All right, at this point, we're gonna have some fun. Sometimes on the show, it's been a while since I've done this, we play a game, <laughs> word association game. I say 10 words. And I want you to think, say the first thing that comes to mind. Maybe it's a memory. Maybe it touches a policy issue. Say whatever you want. There's no wrong answer. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. Game? Sure. All right. So, and there's no wrong answer. First word, Bridgeport. Opportunity. Next word is Mohegan Sun. I think the answer might be opportunity to all of these, but opportunity. You can expand on each one. You don't have to just answer with one. Well, I, you know, I gave you my speech on Bridgeport. If there's any town, town that should work, um, it's Bridgeport. With respect to Mohegan, um, the tribes have been good partners to Connecticut. I think we could work better with them. Um, Governor Lamont was able to resolve the online gambling uh, situation. But um, that's a big opportunity to, to both bring in revenues and create a bit of a tourism or more of a tourism opportunity for Connecticut. Yukon Huskies. <laughs> we just get a laugh on that one. 
<laughs> well, I graduated from Fairfield in 1984. They were a powerhouse. Um, I hope they get back to where they used to be. That's all we got on UConn? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> well, no, I'll also say on UConn, we got to rein in the spending there. You, you, you've got former presidents making $400,000 a year. You've got the university president with two houses. You've got, I mean, they should be on, you've got the Yukon Health Center, uh, which I think should be privatized and, and, and run like a business. So I think just like everywhere else in the state of Connecticut that are government owned or quasi public, the spending has been too loose. And, and, and the people that are paying the price are the students of Connecticut who should be getting a, a, a good value for education uh, for in-state students. And the tuition in, for in-state students has largely priced a lot of these kids out of going there. And, and, and again, we got to rein in the spending and, 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 and run it more uh, professionally. All right, changing direction, leaf season. Leaf season. Leaf season, you know, that's why some, that's what people think about. Some people think about when they think of Connecticut. Well, people like sure Roberto, can, they come out here for the leaves. I'm not sure I can do much to manage that, John. How does it work? If you have a hot, wet summer, the leaf foliage is the better or the reverse? <laughs> uh -huh. So more than just the leaf season? Okay. Next one is Sikorsky. Sikorsky has been in the news lately. Sikorsky. Yeah. You look at the defense industry in Connecticut, it's, it's one of the top industries. I actually, uh, when I was with Pricewaterhouse, I met my future, not my future, I met my wife at Sikorsky. Uh, so I've got very fond memories, but what a terrific company. They actually make the uh, presidential helicopter, great legacy. It's a perfect example of why Connecticut should be successful. You look at a company like that, that was founded here, that's been here for decades, um, just a terrific company. It's, I think it's unfortunate that United Technologies moved out. I know part of it was the merger with Raytheon, but we do need to do a better job of keeping these, these typical Connecticut companies here. Can I tell you one quick story, John? You may have heard it, but uh, before GE moved out, then Governor Malloy came and they gave a presentation to Jeff Immel about why uh, GE should stay in Connecticut. And they started the presentation and on the first page of the presentation had had a picture of a jet engine. And the CFO, Jeff Bornstein, who lives in Ridgefield nudged uh, Immel and said, guess what, that jet engine is a uh, Boeing jet engine. Uh, it's not a GE jet engine, not a Boeing, but whoever the competition <laughs> was. Uh, so that shows you the level of preparation uh, that some of these government officials, this is the largest employer in Connecticut. And he goes in to meet with GE and he's got a picture of the competitor's engine on page one. Uh, then my next one, uh, my wife contributed. She said, favorite beach, beach. Favorite beach? I'll tell you, I used to live in Westport. I loved uh, Campo Beach. Just, uh, my kids were young. There was that great playground there. You had a great food situation. I, I would, I, I've not been, we, we drove by the Greenwich Beach the other day. It was beautiful, but uh, I'd have to say Campo. Okay. Your, uh, the next one, what do you think of when I say I-95? <laughs> Traffic. Yeah. <laughs> what? what <laughs> What's amazing to me is even during COVID, there were traffic jams. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. It seems like we're in a, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but they say they never stop painting the Golden Gate Bridge. They go from one side to the other and then back and forth. It just seems like we're never done fixing our roads in Connecticut. I think it's a good uh, opportunity for public-private partnerships where we bring in the private sector to help. Maybe with the, the money we're getting for the infrastructure bill, maybe that will help fix it. But I assume it impacts housing values. Uh, I know it impacts the time of commute and uh, it just seems to be a problem we haven't been able to fix. I thought you would just say opportunity again. <laughs> well, it is an opportunity. I mean, what's the one thing that works reasonably well on, on I-95 is the rest areas. And, and, and in my view, the reason is they sold it off to a private equity firm told, called Macquarie. They run, they run the rest stops as a business. So they're relatively efficient. They're relatively updated. And I just think if you can have the private sector take over running something from the government sector, whether it's the Department of Motor Vehicles or whatever, I think nine times out of 10, the private sector is gonna do a better job. All right, well then that, that's a good segue into my next one. 
And you could answer, you could go in two directions with this, but I was going to say Yale, New Haven. You could either focus on the Yaleness or the New Havenness. New Haven's a, an interesting case. Um, again, you, you wonder why they're not more successful. Uh, you've got the best university in the world. I'm not sure what you do about it, but it does kind of bother me that they've got a $30 billion endowment and then the area surrounding it is, is so impoverished. Um, they are a good partner to the state of Connecticut. They do, do do a lot for the city, but it just it, it just bothers me. It's, it's, it's a perfect example of the, the wealth inequality in our state. I don't have any answers for you right now. It's, it's, it's more of a, a Elliker, Mayor Elliker situation, but you would hope that you could use some of the advantages to, to, to help that economy. And how about Milford, Connecticut? I like Milford. I grew up in North Haven. I actually got married in, well, I think it was Milford, the Grassy Hill Country Club. And uh, it's a terrific city. Again, it, 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 it's a great location right off the highway. And uh, there's things we should be able to do there. All right, you got any, Roberto? You got any good words? When you what I, Connecticut? I, I, well, the thing I, you know, you had talked about that part of your job as governor is being essentially like a marketing person for the state. I think the state, I mean, this is on a, you know, yes, there's numbers, there's taxes, there's all this. But what makes, what inspires people is a way of life. And I think the Connecticut needs to tell its story. It should look to something like the film industry. You know, that's what happened in New York. New York was very bleak in the 70s and 80s. And then there came shows like Friends and Seinfeld. And then there came Sex and the City, which glamorized the city and redefined it for everybody else in the country. And it made it accessible and fun. And I believe the Connecticut needs to look to the, the film industry, essentially, to produce content that's going to define it for those who aren't there. Roberto, we're and, not doing Real Housewives of Connecticut. No, but think we're about not doing sex. I'm telling you, listen, it's listen, the film wrong. industry, Connecticut needs to tell its story and the film industry helps do that. It paints a picture for people. It has the power to get into one psychology and that's how you attract business to Connecticut. It changes the mindset and then people take their ideas and they actually consider Connecticut as a place to grow those ideas. I mean, we just talked about Milford. I mean, imagine a show like Dallas or something where people are coming into the city, but yet they're going to Connecticut. And they're on their horse farms and they're playing their polo and they're doing this and that. That's glamorizing. I mean, it's, I'm just, just saying, I've said it, I said it once before. Okay, bye. Connecticut has an extraordinary opportunity to tell a wonderful story that changes the mindset of people. That's what's going to drive them to come. It's a lifestyle. Chief Marketing Officer Bob Stefanowski, tell us about the marketing plan. I think there's a couple of things. Number one is you got to get out of Hartford. It, you, you know, if you're the chief salesperson for Connecticut, you got to get overseas. I mean, Dan Malloy went overseas a, a fair amount of time, and, and you got to look at companies that are willing. You got to provide the incentives, number one. And then you've got to look at, at just like Florida and North Carolina do, and we should be going to other states. Once we've got a big, better regulatory regime, once we lower that state, that uh, corporate income tax a little bit, and then you got to get on the road because all states are competing for this stuff. Film industry, I agree with you, but we need to create an environment where they want to come here. The other one I was looking at um, last time around was currency. The regulations in New York, are, and I don't know whether it's going to last or not. Part of me says it's the, the biggest bubble in the world. But the regulations in New York were really strict and, and we could have created an environment in Connecticut to get some of those companies to move here. The third one is tourism. If you look at for every dollar we spend on tourism in Connecticut, we get $4 back in, in the terms of park fees, hotels, uh, stays, um, local restaurants. And the, what Governor Lamont and the prior administration have done is they've cut the budget for tourism. So what, you know, what industry do you ever see that you get a four to one return? I would keep investing in tourism at least until it got two to two to one ratio. And it also helps the, 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 the feeling of people. We used to go around the country and brag about it. Now you go around the country and you almost feel like, well, I don't know that I wanna bring it up. And, and you know, I think we've lost a little bit of our optimism. We can absolutely get back to where we are and, 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 and it starts with those small things like investing in the state, attracting industries, 
stimulating tourism. We got a lot to offer. Um, I don't think it's great when, when, when politicians go out of state on vacation. Well, you're going on vacation, why not vacation here? You're bas basically what you're telling people is, well, I, I've got a few days off, I'm getting the heck out of my own state. <laughs> so I, I just think there's a lot of things we could be doing to give people a little bit more faith that we're gonna to start to turn things around. Susan Engel, you've been here a while. You were mentioned earlier as one of those people who might be going to Florida, might be sticking around. At, at... Oh, I'm never leaving. You're never leaving. You, you muted yourself. yourself. Okay, well, there you go. You got, you got one person who's never leaving. Okay. Bob? Bob, one, one of the biggest surprises for me of the entire pandemic was what happened to the Department of Motor Vehicles. It went from being a place where I'd rather, you know, basically break a toe or if I could give away a finger to avoid, you know, having to go myself to a place where, I mean, I went down to register a car and it was 45 minutes from when I left my house until I returned to my house. And it was a pleasant experience. People knew what was going on. It was just, it was so night and day and still just baffled by it all. Are there any lessons that we can take from that as to, again, how to help, you know, what is required in government to operate better and, and to expand that sort of an attitude toward uh, the rest of the interactions? I, I would say two things. One is automation. One of the reasons is I, I believe it's gotten easier is they've, they've made significant investments in their IT systems. Um, they've allowed certain things to happen online now that you used to have to go in for. The other thing is I think you need to, to select these commissioners of the different um, agencies very, very carefully because they're running big businesses mm -hmm. in and of themselves. And I know I'm going to need a mix. And, and people tell me government is very different than business. And, you know, it's, it's not the same. I, I get it. It's more consensus driven and you can't dictate. But I do think having people around with a business perspective will really help in some of these agencies, Department of Transportation, others, where, where you really have to run these like a business. And um, to your point, it shows what you can do with, with the right. I'm a big believer in leadership. I was at GE for 15 years under Jack Walsh, and I know GE's had its issues recently, but I'm all about leadership, setting the right culture, giving the right motivations to people. People are driven by, by uh, compensation. And um, I think we got to start thinking about running these different divisions like that and, and getting the best people. So I'm looking now and noticing in the chat a couple of, uh, a couple more words to uh, ask you about. Um, one person said toll roads. Uh, any thoughts on toll roads? I, I fought very strenuously against tolls. I believe it's, it's just another tax okay. on people. And what's a new set cost? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Tolls. Sorry, what, somebody came off. Uh, to me, if you bring the private sector in, it's, it's maybe a high-speed lane at an option that you pay for. But I don't think we should be tolling universally people in Connecticut it's already the high, one of the highest cost states I, I don't think we should be adding that on the special transportation fund of the state of Connecticut has been consistently rated by politicians to spend money in the general fund and other purposes they supposedly had a quote lockbox on the transportation fund that would prevent them from rating it they still rated it now they've got a deficit and their answer is tolls and my answer is that's not the answer Uh, John Bainton talks about rising sea level. I think that's maybe a broader question of uh, Long Island Sound. Any thoughts on Long Island Sound and well, environmental great, issues? Great. Uh, one of the best assets we have. I think we, we've gone part of the way towards cleaning that up. I do think global warming is a problem. I don't know what the real issue is, um, but I do think we have to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. I think it's another opportunity for Connecticut. Green energy is one of the fastest growing um, fields in the entire world right now. We've got Yale, we've got UConn. That's an area that we could be at the forefront of and create jobs with our universities. That's a perfect example of a growing industry that we're well positioned to take care of. Instead of throwing a TCI gas tax on fossil fuels like was, was proposed, let's be looking past the next year in terms of where these industries are headed and what we can do to be ahead of it. Don, can I, can I inter, inter, uh, interject? Um, Bob, you mentioned you know, job creation. 
Um, with the supply chain problems that we're seeing, there's a lot of talk about manufacturing and about bringing back, you know, what, what is your take on, on how Connecticut can benefit from that? I think it's a big opportunity. Connecticut, as you know, used to have a massive manufacturing base. And, and again, with, with the quality of, of, of labor that we have in the schools, and that's why, again, I'm, I'm really um, dedicated to, to investing in more trade schools. I think it's a big opportunity for us. And, you know, manufacturing isn't what it was when I was growing up with a guy sitting at a drill press. <laughs> manufacturing is high tech machines that, that are doing this with precision. And I think that's a big opportunity as well. And I, I think we got to look past the next year and past the next election cycle and start inv if we're going to turn this thing around, we got to start looking more down the road. And there, there's enough opportunities out there. We're just not taking advantage of them. So, so if I were to paraphrase what I think uh, you said, tell me if I'm wrong, but the strategy is one of cutting taxes to make Connecticut more attractive. You're going to pay for the cuts in taxes by making a forensic audit and basically finding excess spending and cutting the spending problem. So we got a tax cut strategy, we got a spending problem strategy, and then um, we're going to invest in. Well, what I'm hearing is a deregulation strategy that you're not going to tell the cities what to do, but you're going to is the word gently incentivize them to make the right decisions with respect to affordable housing, uh, inviting in business, uh, m inviting in manufacturing? Is that, is think, that generally yeah, the strategy? I, I, it's not the perfect summary, John, but there are certain elements of that. I think we should be supporting the cities. Um, the, the, for example, the current proposal to cut the, the property tax, that comes right out of the city budget. So it's great that we're cutting taxes uh, if, if it gets passed, but we shouldn't be taking more money out of the cities. So we need to make sure that that money gets back to the cities and it, historically it hasn't. So I think it's making sure the cities are well-funded, making sure we give them the education funding they need, supporting them with, with a reduced uh, regulatory framework at a state level. But my job is not to tell the mayor of, of Milford what to do every day. I think it's creating the environment. The other thing that, that we've proposed, two other things we've proposed, one is with respect to energy costs. The energy companies have a guaranteed rate of return right now. They make 9.35% regardless of their level of performance. So you could have a storm where people's power is out for, month, for weeks and, and, and their prescription drugs are spoiling and, and, and everything else. And, and the executives of the energy companies are still getting multi-million dollar bonuses. We need to start to pay the energy companies for performance. The last thing I'll say is we need to tighten the ethics code for the state of Connecticut. There are too many friends and family deals that are technically within the ethics codes that I think shouldn't happen. If we had another hour, I could give you some examples. But so I, I really think it starts with the people in Hartford trying to realize that it's not their money. It's our money. They're serving us. We need to spend it more wisely. To the extent we don't need it, we need to give it back to people. And I'm, you know, I'm a supply sider. I think the lower the tax rate, in the long run, that's going to grow industry. It's going to grow housing prices. It's going to grow everything else. And you're going to get more tax revenue than, than you have right now with a very high tax regime. All right, my final question. And I know I've, uh, you know, this has been a great hour. You only lost narrowly four years ago during a and, and frankly, I didn't know who you were. Most people in the state didn't know who you were. And you only lost, right? You had never run for anything. No. You're not a career politician. And you came out of from literally nowhere to uh, within three points of winning the state. You said, quote, I'm going to be a much better candidate this time. What did you mean? Uh, you learn a lot, John. It's like my, my wife and I, describe it as you're a senior and you're going into your senior year of high school and you transfer high schools, right? So you don't know, you kind of know what's going on, but you really don't. So number one, it needs to be a broader platform. Is it about the income tax? Absolutely. But it's like, we didn't talk about public safety and the impact that crime will have on housing values unless we corral that. It's about um, inflation. It's about um, security. It's about transparency in government. So number one, a broader platform. 
The second one, John, is I didn't get out enough. I think when I can talk to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, that's a very different impression than what you see on television. It's certainly a different impression than you see when someone's running an attack ad on you, particularly in Fairfield County, which is arguably where I lost the election. Um, we won 130 of 169 towns, but I still lost. And um, Fairfield County, I definitely need to spend more time there this time around. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, guys. Thank you this very, very great much. Hour. Very good. Thank it's you, very Roberto. good questions. Thank, thank you, you Michael. Thank you, Scott Hobbs, for helping me out. And thank you, most of all, Bob Stefanowski. I think we got a really good one-on-one. -on -one. It felt like we were sitting in your living room and getting to know you one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm glad thank we spent you, the hour. Yeah. And I hope it was good for you as well. It was terrific. Thanks, John. Thanks, Roberto, and everybody else. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, bye-bye.